Despite the cogency and good sense of Peter Singer's principle of equal consideration of interests, which shows us that our habits are simply not justified, there's still a very significant misunderstanding that prevents us from looking at animals as moral beings. It prevents us from including them in our moral circle. It has to do with our idea of what's natural. There's still this idea that eating meat is part of the natural chain of things and that we're part of the chain and we eat each other and that's the way it is. This is an error and it's really important to look at this misunderstanding. Speaking only in terms of quantity, what we see today is unprecedented. Factory farming methods that exist today have never before been seen in history. To meet the demands of the quantity of meat that people are eating today um, requires unnatural, absolutely unnatural gro growth hormones being fed to the animals, conditions on factory farms, animals stacking in crates where they can't move. This is about as unnatural as it gets. It's unheard of, it's crude, it's barbaric, and there's no way to say that it's natural, and there's no way to say that the quantity of meat eating that we're involved with is natural. Besides, non-human animals can't consider alternatives the way we can. Alternatives that would be better for them. They would thrive too on a better diet, but they don't have the choice the way we do. We don't look to the jungle for moral guidance. We wouldn't model our behavior on other creatures. So even if animals do kill each other in the wild, it's no model for us. It's no standard for us. It's no justification for us. And there's no reason for us to say that we should be doing the same thing in our human society. I mean, we've all heard of those insects. I think it's uh, one particular species of black widow that kills, uh, she kills her mate after, uh, after, after mating, but uh, we wouldn't model our behavior on the Black Widow. It's, uh, it's almost silly to put it in those terms, but yet we want to have it both ways. We want to justify uh, the law of the jungle, you know, and model our behavior uh, on that and justify our behavior on that, but we also want to see ourselves as superior. We also want to see ourselves as better and we can't have it both ways. And I would offer that it's more natural to look at ourselves as beings who want to seek a lifestyle with greater purpose and, uh, and greater conscientiousness. We want to define our lives as individuals based on higher moral standards. We want to leave less of a footprint on this planet. We want to do less harm to the planet and the creatures that we share the planet with. We want to live by higher ideals. To me, that is more natural, to fulfill our potential as compassionate creatures. This misunderstanding regarding the idea of naturalness comes from um, this idea of the Darwinian survival of the fittest as well. I have a lot to say about that. It's really an important point to bring up because it represents not only an error in misunderstanding, but more importantly, it represents an error in terms of Darwin's own position on things. It misrepresents Darwin's own ideas. The expression survival of the fittest doesn't come from Darwin at all. It comes from Herbert Spencer and his social Darwinism of the 1800s, which despite the name does not reflect Darwin's philosophy. Sure, he had read Darwin, but Herbert Spencer had his own agenda and his own program, and people throw around the expression in their attempt to justify what they see as normal behavior, natural behavior. But factory farming is not natural. In fact, Darwin himself rejected anthropocentrism, which is a, which is a big word, and it basically just, just means that we as humans see ourselves as the most superior kinds of creatures, the center of existence, anthropocentrism. We see ourselves as sitting in the center of existence. But Darwin himself was against anthropocentrism. He was against this kind of bias against the natural world. And I'm gonna quote Darwin himself. He said, only a few persons now 
dispute that animals possess a power of reasoning. Animals may constantly be seen to pause, deliberate, and resolve. The more the habits of animals are studied, the more he attributes to reason and the less to unlearned instincts. And that comes from Darwin, The Descent of Man, 1871. He said that because like Jane Goodall, he watched, he really watched, he observed, and he helped us learn. He helped us all learn more about the animals that we share the planet with. And so to say that eating animals is natural and it's part of the survival of the fittest is to commit several misunderstandings at the same time. It's to cause a grave error um, in terms of what Darwin himself really stood for, and it's to misunderstood what is meant by natural. <clears throat> There's an idea in India known as ahimsa, nonviolence. And the idea of nonviolence is why many yogis and monks and Jains have for thousands of years in India maintained a light, pure, clean vegetarian diet. Ancient Indian scriptures explain that a spiritual force, which you can call God if you want to, runs through all of nature and through all of things in the universe. And so ahimsa is the absence of injury toward all of those things which to the Indians are divine. In closing, I want to say that I was happy to learn years ago that a parallel idea of non-injury exists in some of the Western religious traditions as well. For example, I have in my hands a booklet called Honoring God's Creation, and it documents the tradition of Christianity and vegetarianism. And so even for my Christian friends, there are terrific resources that support the practice of vegetarian in the context of Christianity. I would go to ChristianVeg.com for more. <clears throat> I actually want to quote, too. It's worth quoting. And I'm going to quote no less a figure than Mother Teresa. She said, The animals, too, are created by the same loving hand of God which created us, and it is our duty to pr protect them and to promote their well-being. She was a true saint. Richard Schwartz, who uh, founded the wonderful website Christ, uh, JewishVeg.com, has done terrific work in explaining Jewish law and the fact that it more than supports vegetarianism in the context of the Jewish lifestyle. In fact, it advocates it. And he explains in his wonderful website JewishVeg.com um, the Torah and certain passages from the Torah that advocate animal welfare and the fact that many rabbis are today advocating vegetarianism. They explain that vegetarianism is a superior position within the context of Jewish practice. And so on this point, I would close in, uh, in celebrating the time that we live in. This is a time that we can look at our own place in this world and look at the environment and the fact that we have the power to make changes and to prevent global warming from getting worse and to take our health within our own hands and to promote well-being among the animals that are so beautiful and that we share the planet with.